morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where yesterday DC got themselves a much needed positive headline. And that was with the new director that they've put on, The Flash. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, they and Seth Graham Smith parted ways. Uh, you know, I think they did that in the best way possible. And luckily, for once, uh, DC seemed to be able to fix a mistake before it was too late. Uh, Seth Graham Smith, of course, is uh, the writer of uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham Lincoln uh, Vampire Hunter, and both those movies have not fared particularly well. He also worked on the script for Dark Shadows. He has not had a ton of luck in Hollywood. And in fact, we're going to be talking about Pride and Pre Prejudice and Zombies a little bit later in this episode, as it has killed someone else's career. Well, maybe just had it uh, ha uh, have to transition, but we'll see what happens. But anyway, the new director is Rick Famuyiwa, uh, who happens to be a black director, and he is working on a film that is not a quote-unquote black film, even a quote-unquote black superhero film. Uh, for instance, recently we've seen Ryan Coogler take over Black Panther and Patty Jenkins working on Wonder Woman. You know, this idea that the director had to match the ethnicity or gender of the lead character. But that's not the case here. This seems to be a uh, colorblind uh, directing uh, a, um, choice so to speak uh but this is this is a very interesting uh thing for a couple of reasons i think that it's very inspiring for people who uh you know uh, diverse people who want to get uh into hollywood and have these high profile careers i think that's very encouraging uh, but i also think there's a really clear business reason behind it i don't think it's totally an altruistic move on dc's part i'm sure they were like oh wow this will make us look really good uh but that was probably just the icing on the cake because this is actually in line with the way that the studios have been picking directors for these blockbuster projects. And also, I want to make it very clear, I think that Rick Famuyiwa is a very talented director. He directed Dope. Uh, that's the film that I believe, I mean, he's directed some other movies, uh, you know, more traditional mainstream features, but Dope is the very outside of the box clever movie that I think allow, put him in a position to get this gig. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to also point out that this is certainly not the first time that a, a director of uh, color has, or, or even a different gender, uh, has been chosen to direct a major movie. Uh, for instance, Marvel recently hired uh, Taiki Watiti to direct Thor Ragnarok. Uh, and also, Emily Carmichael has just been hired uh, by Steven Spielberg and Colin Trevorrow to direct this new movie that those two gentlemen came up with. And Emily Carmichael has never even helmed a feature film, much less a blockbuster. Uh, and there's a learning curve, you know, it's, it's a shame that a lot of the times these directors will come onto these projects and uh, maybe need one under their belt before they get really good. You know, you said that with Brian Singer, but I think Colin Trevorrow hit the ground running, you know, very nicely with um, uh, Jurassic World. And of course, back in the day, F. Gary Gray did the Italian job. So this has certainly happened in the past, uh, but, you know, I think on a movie of this scale in today's environment, I think it's very encouraging indeed. And maybe we'll see it happen with a little more regularity. Uh, and I think that's probably true because there are so many films being made right now. Basically what you're seeing, and this is the business aspect that I, I, I mentioned just a moment ago, and that's that there's a run on directors, right? I mean, there are so many big high profile projects coming out of Hollywood right now because of all these uh, cinematic universes and franchises that there's only so many directors to go around, particularly a director that has some buzz, right? Like uh, it used to be that, you know, the only thing that mattered was who was in your cast. But these days, moviegoers are very savvy and who's writing and who's directing does matter, especially to the type of movie fan that's going to make a lot of noise online, which has become a really important part of a movie's uh, image, right? Uh, much to the chagrin of Hollywood. But anyway, uh, that's why you've seen Gareth Edwards, you've seen Colin Trevorrow, Ryan Johnson. Uh, surprisingly, Gareth uh, Evans from The Raid, and Raid 2, has just not been able to cross over to Hollywood, uh, that, which is unfortunate. But anyway, and then you see like Emily, now Emily Carmichael's coming up, uh, Rick Femiua. And I believe that that's because uh, they've run out, run out of uh, white guy indie directors, basically. And it's interesting. There are so many directors working right now, but none of them have really moved on to be like a big name. Like, where are the Nolans, right? Like, you know, you have like Spielberg, Scorsese, uh, you know, a lot of really famous directors. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul, uh, well, Paul Thomas, oh, he didn't make the cut, but there was a Paul Thomas Anderson story. Maybe I can cover it on Monday. Uh, but, you know, you don't see a, you know, for all the focus on behind the camera talent, 
you don't see, I think, really strong brands emerging just quite yet. So hopefully one of that's I think that's the next step to get another Nolan out of this. But we'll see. But anyway, I think, as I said, they're out of the white guys. So just out of need, they're moving to uh, the non-white uh, directors and the female directors. And hopefully those individuals are able to step up to the plate and deliver so that Hollywood will continue to do that. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's a, a sheer size of the amount of opportunity that's available right now. And, the, and that, you know, you're getting progress because there isn't enough there aren't enough, uh, you know, white guys to fill all the roles. You know, Hollywood is desperate for directors who have some kind of buzz. And Rick Famuyiwa definitely does after Dope. I think he's actually a pretty good choice. Uh, we'll see how good his learning curve is with special effects. But I thought the Dope was very high energy. It was quirky. Uh, and I think that's a, a very good uh, match with Ezra Miller as The Flash. So I think this is a great choice. There's a lot of pressure on him to deliver, naturally. Uh, and we'll see how he does. Uh, I wouldn't say he's as uh, steady as Ryan Coogler. I think Ryan Coogler is a little bit of a better director, just more masterful, uh, but but we'll see. I think it's a really fascinating choice, and we'll see how Taiki Waititi does on Thor Ragnarok, uh, because, you know, Gareth Edwards ha hasn't really worked out, as we're going to talk about in just a moment. And I think people are, you know, torn on Colin Trevorrow, and we'll see how Ryan Johnson does with episode eight. Uh, I guess J.J. Abrams is another big-name director to emerge lately. You know, you say what you will about him, but he delivers more often than not at the box office, both as a director and a producer. All right, so, and he's a Spielberg protege. All right, so anyway, that's the first story of the day. And I'm very curious to see how you feel about it. And also, uh, now that you see that it's not totally, like, uh, a progressive action, it's just, you know, uh, you know, supply and demand. Uh, and uh, there's just such a high demand for directors, luckily, uh, that the, the, the supply needs to go outside the box to, to be met. All right, so the second story of the day, speaking of indie directors that sometimes don't work out, that would be Gareth Edwards. Now, a lot of you, when I talked about this the other day, were like, I loved Godzilla. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody, especially when you have like a, a fan-centric movie like that that has a strong fan base, you know, Godzilla is a character, and there's like a level of artistry to it. Yeah, sure, some people are going to like it. I liked Speed Racer. I think Speed Racer is genius, actually. It's live-action anime. It's just so perfectly, it just so perfectly captures, you know, what anime is, which, although, unfortunately, is foreign to a lot of audiences, and that's why I think it wasn't particularly well accepted. However, I don't go around yelling at people saying Speed Racer is a genius movie, and if you don't like it, you're, you're wrong, right? I mean, I think that it's really important to uh, step back and be able to look at things objectively and to separate your own personal tastes and fandom from, you know, what's actually happening. For instance, I love Batman v Superman. I think it's a fantastic, brilliant film. We'll see how history judges it going forward, but I think certainly for the meantime, uh, it has a bad image, right? And I'm able to acknowledge that. So uh, I just wanted to, to point that out. Now, Gareth, but Gareth Edwards, you know, he's going to help me here in making my argument because he's really shot Disney in the foot when it comes to Star, uh, Star Wars uh, Rogue One. More details have emerged on this. You know, I was going to cover this in its own video, but the leaked character guide from a couple of, uh, like a week or so ago, was revealed by Disney to be inaccurate. So I'm not going to cover that, so I was going to put that all in one video. Uh, but so anything that you got from those leaked... Uh, uh, character pages apparently is incorrect so I would disregard those uh, and who knows if this rumor is true but the rumor is is that 40% of the movie needs to be reshot that is absolutely shocking that so much of the film would need to be reshot uh, that is a real you know I, mean, I guess I guess that Disney does not want to have a Batman v Superman situation and they've tested this film and they feel that it is not a four quadrant movie and we're going to discuss what that means specifically but basically, uh, the rumor is not only that 40% needs to be reshot, but that they were doing a lot of rewrites on set, which is really a bad idea. Uh, and so therefore, the tone is uneven and does not fit with the Star Wars brand. Uh, Christopher, Christopher McQuarrie worked on the script. Christopher McQuarrie is a fantastic screenwriter. Uh, and he turned out to be a fantastic director. He's actually another director that's emerging. Very, very good. He did... Uh, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, speaking of rogues. Uh, but anyway, who would rewrite a Christopher McQuarrie script? You'd have to be absolutely nuts, or Gareth Edwards. But anyway, Disney, and, and also, so they said they want to add more humor, a lighter feel to it, and a lot of you said, well, that's not, and I agree with this to some degree, that's not what I was sold on. You know, this was supposed to be Star Wars 
a war movie, right? The Black Hawk Down of the Star Wars cinematic universe. The tone was supposed to be different. That was the whole idea. Uh, and I was excited about that too. But I think that you have a situation where The Force Awakens was just so strong and, uh, you know, $2 billion worldwide, only the third movie ever to make that, to join the $2 billion club after James Cameron's two movies, Titanic and, um, I mean, Avatar and then Titanic that I think it's put added pressure on the suits at Disney and Lucasfilm to make sure that they don't slow that momentum, right? So, cause like, I would have liked to have really seen Rogue One, the gritty war movie, right? I mean, I thought the trailer in some ways, if you take out the whole Jin Erso Mockingjay stuff, otherwise I thought it looked really good. But a four quadrant movie means that it appeals to everyone. What it means by four quadrants is they divide, you know, the quadrants are uh, two categories of men and women, and then you split it in half with the age group, right? Like usually under 25 and over 25. So four quadrant means it appeals to all those people, men and women uh, over and under 25 years old. And so that's where four, the term four quadrant comes from. And The Force Awakens was definitely a four quadrant movie. That's how it was able to make $2 billion. Uh, but they feel that, you know, the having such a, uh, you know, uh, strong aesthetic and being more serious, uh, you know, to be a Black Hawk Down Star Wars movie would really maybe shut out some of the audience and not give it as wide a net as it would like. Uh, so the question is begged then, can you make a small Star Wars movie? And by small, I mean, like, let's take Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road was incredibly stylistic, very dark, but certainly would be suitable for, you know, it was rated R, but I think just, you know, for some very adult, uh, undertones and sometimes overtones, but I think anyone of any age could have really watched Mad Max personally. But anyway, Mad Max only made 378 worldwide. So 378, right, versus 2 billion. Like, Star Wars can't have that kind of discrepancy in its numbers. It needs to be continually delivering. It needs to be like the MCU. And make no mistake, I'm sure that what Star Wars is doing, you know, with Kathleen Kennedy is modeled after what Kevin Feige is doing with the MCU. Why not? It's incredibly successful. And you don't see a lot of, I mean, you see a little bit of tonal shift in the MCU, but overall, the formula is very consistent and the tone is very consistent overall to the movies. And it's liked. I mean, some people are complaining about it these days, particularly because, you know, because DC doesn't deliver that tone and doesn't deliver that formula, there's like, um, I think a little bit of, uh, you know, not a fair shake to DC, and that's making some DC fans, I think, understandably upset. But yeah, you have to step back and you have to look at, you know, I wish everybody would step back and be objective, right? What a, what a better world of fandom that would be. But anyway, I think you also need to step back and look at what Disney's dealing with here, and I think that you're probably going to get a Rogue One that's just a regular old Star Wars movie, uh, and with the hopes that it will, you know, perform more at the level that it needs to. However, if it is just a regular old Star Wars movie, what's the point of making them? If you're not going to experiment with the brand, why do it? Why not just have episodes come out every other year, right? And then you don't oversaturate the market either. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, I think Star Wars is a little bit tougher than the MCU because people are used to the MCU. You know, the MCU defined this, its space. But Star Wars has been around for, you know, for decades, since the 70s. So people expect a certain thing from that, and uh, Disney's trying to change what you expect from Star Wars. And I'm not sure if it will work. Especially because one of the reasons The Force Awakens did so well is because it gave people exactly what they wanted from Star Wars off of nostalgia because it was a retread of Episode Four. So fascinating. Fascinating situation. We'll see how this develops. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts down below. Now, the third story of the day, I decided to go with this Sony story because, you know, everybody's paying a lot of attention to Sony because of Ghostbusters. And there's been a big shakeup over at Sony this week. Uh, just the other day, their head of their TV division, Steve Mosco, resigned. And now, yesterday, Doug Belgrad, who is the number two on movies underneath Tom Rothman, who was just recently uh, replaced... He has resigned. Now, he's still going to be involved with Sony as a producer slash financier. What does that mean? Well, he's going to have his own shingle. He's probably going to have an office on the lot, and he's going to produce movies that Sony will have first dibs on uh, in terms of distributing. Also, when you're a financier, you go and you raise money for movies that Sony wants to make. For instance, Warner Brothers has a huge financier and Brett Ratner. Brett Ratner has reinvented himself as a financier. That's why every time you see a Warner Brothers movie these days, it says Rat Pack in front of it. Whenever you see the Rat Pack logo, that's Brett Ratner. And he just funnels money into Warner Brothers so they can make their movies. Uh, so that's what Doug Belgrad is going to do. But they're having a big problem over at Sony. I think their biggest problem is that they simply do not. And, you know, Amy Pascal, of course, just left recently. She was supposed to become, like, a big producer over there, uh, but that really hasn't materialized. But anyway, they had the whole email uh, leak scandal and the whole problem with the interview. But they're really, they're, they're really lacking in terms of... Um, 
franchises and brands. That's the game, name of the game these days in Hollywood. Every studio is trying to line up their franchises, their ducks in a row, right? So Sony really only has Bond, and I don't believe the Bond contract has been renewed yet. I don't think they're going to 100% keep Bond going forward. We'll see what happens. And even their last Bond, Spectre, was no Skyfall, right? But Spectre is the last hit that they've had. Concussion for award season with Will Smith did not do well. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, that Seth Graham uh, Smith film, uh, he didn't direct it, but it's based on his uh, his work, and only made $16 million worldwide. And the Brothers Grimsby from Sasha Baron Cohen was a huge disaster. And I think, obviously, uh, Ghostbusters is going to probably go down in history. Uh, Hollywood history is like the movie equivalent of the Hindenburg. So anyway, Sony obviously needs to do some stuff. I mean, they have a very good thing coming up with Spider-Man, but they're working in tandem with Marvel. But come on, you can see from the discussion already, Marvel's going to get the credit for that win, if it is a win. If it's not a win, it'll probably go to Sony. So Sony really needs to redefine itself, and I think their first step is obviously to get some new blood in there. So we'll see who the hires are, you know, who the number two under Tom Rothman is, uh, and what they do in the, in the TV division. But it's very interesting to see that studio continue to struggle and how they're going to try and fix it. All right, so, because they're like Warner Brothers is struggling, but at least on a higher level, right? So Sony's not even in the game. All right, so the viewer question comes from, I like this one because it kind of talks about directors and that's what we're discussing today. So this is from Nick Films. And Nick says, hi Grace, question, smiley emojis. I just saw a preview screening of The Neon Demon and absolutely adored the film despite its reviews at Cannes. After the screening, when asked about the possibility of going into Hollywood, Nicholas Winding Refn, the director, stated he wasn't interested in following that path, but may in the future change his mind. Uh, you know, he was supposed to, by the way, Logan's run, etc. So I don't know if he was like kicked out of going that path or maybe things fell apart and he became disenchanted with it. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's very nice that no one at the screening reminded him of that. But anyway, he said, uh, Nick continues saying, this makes me ask the question, how do you feel about independent art house directors moving into Hollywood and do you feel they make good films? I love your videos and watch them every day on my ho way home from school. You inspired me to follow my dreams of directing and making good films. Nick from Manchester, England. Ah, Nick. I love it. I love it when you guys paint a picture of how you watch the show. I love that you want to be a director. It's a very good time to be a director, Nick, as we're exploring. Uh, it's also, you know, you can make the jump to blockbuster director much faster these days than you ever could, you know, from indie director. And you don't even have to, like, cut your teeth, you know, on a mid-range film. You can go right to the top because they really need people. So, uh, you know, that, as I said, it's an exciting time to try and get into the directing business. But as for indie art house filmmaker directors going into Hollywood, I think you have to look at Josh Trank. You have to look at Gareth Edwards. I think that, and this is, I think, a really good, really good advice for anyone in any job. If you know, you have to be a team player, and this also factors into the objectivity that I just mentioned, you know, a couple of times throughout this episode. You have to be like, I think, you know, like you should always be giving yourself a reality check, right? You're like, am I delivering? Like, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, people go into the film and they view it strictly uh, as an art form, you know, particularly people who come from the independent art house world. And they feel, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to make a movie that I'm proud of, right? And I think that that, of course, is important, but that's not why you were hired. You were hired as a director because this is a business venture and you were hired to create a great film that makes money, right? Or maybe wins awards. And don't kid yourself, they want you to win awards so that it can make some money, right? Because when your movie wins awards, more people want to go and see it, right? Uh, or maybe you at least get become more of a brand and they'll go see your next movie because they can say, oh, this person's an award winner. You should check out what they're doing. So I think that it's really important to realize, you know, the real, the real, the real aspects of a situation that you find yourself in. You know, not just what are your needs, but what are the needs of the people who hired you? What are the needs of the audience? You know, what is the, you know, this, you're living in, um, uh, ooh, uh, what's the name for it? You know, like, um, it's like a culture, right? Like a society, uh, but everything's interconnected, right? Like, you know, if you make a movie that you pay for and only you are gonna watch, then yes, you can do whatever you want, you know? And also if you, um, uh, if you are a high art direct, I mean a high art artistic individual, like in the world of fine art, as I've said before, you only need one person to like your art because then they buy it for like millions of dollars. But movies are uh, mass consumed, right? You need a lot of people to like what you did, what you've done. Uh, you know, depending on the audience that you're in. If you're making a small art house movie, you just need everybody in that 
community of moviegoers to like your movie, so you can get a high per theater average, right? Uh, but then if you make the jump to these bigger movies, these Hollywood blockbusters, you need a lot of people, more people to like your movie so that someone says, oh, I'm glad I hired you, you really delivered. Because then you're gonna, if you don't, you're gonna go home. Uh, and also Josh Trank, you know, he refused to work with Fox. Uh, Fox then, you know, to be fair, Fox messed up his movie, but that never would have happened if he had been working with them uh, in the first place, right? If they had had a good dialogue going and he, he understood their needs. I think that's just good advice for life in general. Understand where the person you're talking to is coming from. Try to understand their point of view. Why are they saying what they're saying? Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they interacting with you? Uh, I just think, and I think whenever a problem arises, uh, in many situations, it's because that hasn't been done. So anyway, uh, I hope that, Nick, that answers your question. And I think that Nicholas Winding Refn, you know, is a very difficult individual. He also recently, I think, said something really horrible about Lars von Trier. I don't know why he would do that to him. Uh, you know, just, I think, always remember, you know, you don't exist in a vacuum, especially if you want to be in a, a business of mass consumption. Uh, and uh, it's important to conduct yourself in that manner. Always be a professional. You want someone to be like, man, I sure am glad I hired that person, not this is a disaster. I can't wait to get rid of them. And I'm going to go tell everybody else they shouldn't hire them. All right. So thank you, Nick. I hope you had a good day at school. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please write down below think of today's top three stories and that viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered on Monday, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.